The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Let's talk about a love story where our two main characters have a magical case of the crabs. Simply irresistible. What the fuck? Um, Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. And J. Wilford Neville. And we are here today to talk about the magical crab movie, <laughs> Simply Irresistible. Is that what it's called? I thought it was Buffy the Crab Slayer. <laughs> that was its European release name, I believe. <laughs> so this is Sarah Michelle Gellar, um, hence the Buffy joke, uh, and uh, Sean Patrick Flannery in his highest performance ever. <laughs> And uh, who else do we have in here? Dylan Baker. Highest uh, performance which... ever. Do you mean like he was high during the filming of this movie? Is that what you're I, saying? I, I thought he played pretty much every scene where he has to have emotion as if he were just baked. <laughs> there was definitely some drug use going on. <laughs> Dylan Baker, whom I love, and Amanda Peet. Patricia Clarkson. I have no idea who that is, but she was great in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> was, she, was she Lois? Yeah. Yeah, I loved Lois. Yeah, Lois, Lois was, was my favorite character. Before we go down this road uh, too far here, let's go <laughs> ahead and get a basic plot synopsis out of the way. And I don't know how the hell to do a plot synopsis that's basic for this movie, <laughs> but if if you want to attempt it, Ford, please okay. feel free. So, Sarah Michelle Geller has inherited her mother's restaurant that's been in the family for 70 years, but she's a terrible cook. And so the restaurant is about to close. She's at the market to get some produce and gets talked into buying some crabs by someone who may or may not be a ghost of a friend of her mother's. It's not entirely clear. Yeah, that's that's so much to talk about. There, but go ahead. <laughs> one of those crabs is magical. They kill and eat the rest, but one of them is magical. <laughs> And somehow... It's like the, it's like the Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> yeah, somehow... The presidential it, pardon turkey. It gives her the magical ability to cook. It, it, it confers that to her by its presence. And so she becomes a great cook. She saves the restaurant. She gets roped into cooking for opening night at a four-star restaurant, even though she's totally unknown. She feeds a bunch of rich people aphrodisiac peaches. The end. <laughs> What's great about this movie is there's no hijinks in Sue because it's ju it starts it's with hijinks. hijinks. Oh, actually, right. I guess I forgot to include the male romantic lead. In yes, and, and and that's something that I I really wanted to talk about. I mean, we'll go through our what the fuck moments first, but I think that's a big question in the movie: is was the ghost or or what I thought was angel? So I think possibly angel was the ghost or angel <laughs> there to get her the cooking job or to get them to fall for each other both neither it's never clear oh uh, when you said angel i was like that wasn't david boreanaz <laughs> <laughs> so let's go through our what the fuck moments which literally i think we could just go through every line in this movie but <laughs> let's let's do some things that stand out i'll i'll begin sarah michelle geller's wardrobe designer gets an opening credit in this movie <laughs> <laughs> Mine is actually related to that. Sarah Michelle Gellar's sexiest dress comes from the Dame Edna collection, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dylan Baker gets the line, You're like a man. You think with your nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand any part of that line. <laughs> <laughs> Relationship Excel spreadsheets with graphs. Eclair roofies. Could I interest you in a Rube Goldberg teeny? A crab in a top hat. A grown-ass man making dolls... What? Fight? Fuck? I, I can't quite tell. Saucy French sous chef. Truffle cult. <laughs> truffle cult, in <laughs> fact. The chef gives out a truffle Eucharist, which is... That's just an odd image. Yeah, truffle cult is actually gonna be my new indie band name. It's <laughs> sort of like a vampire weekend and Nine Inch Nails fusion thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I enjoyed this movie. I don't care. Haters going to hate. I enjoyed it. <laughs> this, this movie was batshit insane and really fun. <laughs> the greatest sin that a movie or a TV show or anything can make, as far as I'm concerned, is to be dull. <laughs> this movie was not dull. No. <laughs> <laughs> At no point did I understand motivations <laughs> or 
and, and anything that was going on. Any of the dialogue. There was one scene specifically that I was like, suddenly this became Twin Peaks for a scene. <laughs> the scene where Dylan Baker is describing his dream and he's talking about seeing his grandfather's face in his shoes. And at the end of the scene, he's like, well, keep thinking about that. <laughs> right. I know it, I will be. <laughs> it's like, why do you go to the manager of the department store you own to have your dreams analyzed? <laughs> Wouldn't it seem there, like maybe a therapist would be in order? This movie was written by someone named Judith, and I can't remember her last name, but the end credits say for Judy. Yeah, this is the only movie that she wrote. She got a producer credit on something else that you've heard of, but which I can't bring up right at the moment. So I have a theory about what's actually happening here. Judy is actually like a leukemia kid, and this movie was her make-a-wish. Her make-a-wish was for all of her friends to make a come and make a movie with her and you know she was a big Buffy fan so of course she wanted to cast Sarah Michelle Gellar in it and Sarah Michelle Gellar saw the script and was like what the okay, <laughs> I'm okay. in dying kid I'm gonna I'm gonna rough it out whatever the hell is going on here it's not like anybody's gonna be talking about this in 16 years <laughs> okay so I think that is a good answer for who was this movie made by <laughs> my question is was the target audience for this movie food fetishists okay so so rom-com watchers crab fetishists <laughs> yes because there is a very sultry scene between that saucy french sous chef and the magical crab right there at the end my note on that was this guy's gonna fuck this crab <laughs> that's what i wrote <laughs> Here, taste a little bit of heaven, my <laughs> mon cher, or whatever the hell it is. I want to try to answer this question. Who is this movie made for? In the video store where I got this, Movie Madness in Portland, Oregon, 10 billion movies and growing, or whatever the hell it is. Best place ever. You guys should check it out. But in the place, in there, it is categorized as family. And when I watched this movie, I was like, <laughs> This is not exactly family friendly. There are quite a few scenes that are adult enough that you might have to have some uncomfortable conversations with a child at the end of this, right? Maybe it means like family if you have congenital mental illness in your family. <laughs> <laughs> or it's family if somebody in your family has leukemia and is going to die early and and you don't mind talking to them about adult things because, you know, once you've had the whole you're going to die soon conversation, it's all just peaches from there, right? Not aphrodisiac peaches. Well, possibly. But yeah, <laughs> so it's, 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 uh, I don't get who the target audience for this movie was. Like, I, it, it, it's not really a rom-com it's not really a family movie i don't know it's almost kind of tim burton wannabe would you say a little bit kind of it's definitely got some some sort of oddity right because sometimes you watch films and they seem very self-indulgent in an irritating way like anything with james franco and seth rogan in it yeah those movies are basically just cinematic masturbation right this one it kind of seems also to be a little bit self-indulgent but just sort of more in a fun way not we're gonna do whatever we want and people have to watch it because we're famous it's like we're gonna do whatever we want because it's our movie and this would be fun it's an invitational self-indulgence if you will rather than a rather than impositional yes when I saw Kill Bill, my response was, if I wanted some guy to masturbate on me, I could probably have done it cheaper. <laughs> this, however, feels like, wow, that was a lot of insight into someone that I never thought I would get. <laughs> okay, so I don't know who the hell this movie was made for. I, I mean, I, we could try to unpack that for hours, but there are elements of a family movie, like the god-awful music throughout. Oh, right. my God. The most, like, annoying opening credits I think I have ever seen. I felt like musical knives were jabbing into my eyes. <laughs> Maybe the key to unpacking this all is, what is the fantastical 
element that's going on in this movie. Because essentially, there's magic, right, right of some sort going on. They float at one point. It's revealed uh, at, at the end. I mean, I guess it's there all along, but it's kind of, uh, you realize at the end, because Aunt Stella, who I literally wrote down, did Aunt Stella die? Because she just disappears at one point and never <laughs> comes back until randomly at the end she pops up. I know, she's in the kitchen, and we're like, you've got a feather boa in the kitchen. That's not sanitary. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, and and she points out that what's happening is that Sarah Michelle Geller can now, when she cooks, her emotions get put into the cooking. And so that's kind of the magic that has happened since this crab came along. Here's how this crab can comes along. Again, we have, and I think this is the only rom-com trope that we fall prey to, except for the idea that there is a one and blah, 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 blah. Or maybe not. I, even that part's unclear. But so the rom-com trope that we have is a uh, male, kind of possibly male. I mean, he could be a ghost, he could be an angel, but he presents as male. A male character forcing food on a woman. Right. And he makes her pay for it. That's right. what I love. This she's like, like... 60 bucks. She's like, okay. Yeah. She's like, I don't like crab and I don't know what to do with it. And he's like, no, take it. 60 bucks. Yeah. yeah. That's, <laughs> that'll be $60. And she's like, oh, okay. I was really worried that she was just going to be mealy mouth the entire film. But thankfully, that was not the case. Yeah. The forcing of food thing as a rom-com trope, I'm not sure to whether to put this in a separate category, but also like uh, Lois feeds what's jonathan it? yeah feeds like forces an eclair into jonathan's mouth yes there's a lot of food forcing <laughs> finger sucking yeah Th this is a like ridiculously sensual film that's that's the thing i'm i'm like I, I i mean i guess a kid watching it wouldn't get it but there is a lot of finger sucking and chewing and licking of things off of other people and it's wow is it is it sensual in here and yet pg Maybe PG right. thirteen. So in any case, the angel slash ghost, because he he does give a name, but I thought the name that nobody recognizes was meant to be like Clarence from It's a Wonderful Life, but I who knows? But he looks old timey, so maybe he's a ghost, and he says that he knows her mother, and he foists this magical crab and a few real crabs. <laughs> onto her, this magical animatronic crab <laughs> that she takes and, and the crab jumps out of the box and just watches for most of the movie. <laughs> and it's really kind of upsetting because for a while I was like, is this crab going to flip out and kill everybody eventually? <laughs> yeah, he just hangs around in the kitchen and every once in a while the camera will pan to him and he'll like move one of his little eye stalks and flap his little pinchers claws? pinchers claws yeah flap yeah. those things around but he only works from one angle like the animatronics clearly are only effective from one angle so the crab is always shot from the same angle every single time i really think that every movie should every now and then just cut to an animatronic crab watching the characters <laughs> are, wait are we the crab <laughs> I think, I think we are. <laughs> my question, here's my serious question. Is the crab her dead mother? <laughs> the uh, crab shows up, and after that, she is able to cook well, which her mother was able to do. Right. Her mother, we assume, wants to see her happy, which is kind of the arc that is foisted upon her uh, once the crab shows up. Right. And he, and he says something at the beginning like your mother is disappointed in you or you know and she says my mother's dead and he says well that's no reason to discount her opinion or whatever right i, I kept waiting for that reveal when she would realize that the crab is her mother and she would have some heartfelt talk with it or any sort of reveal having to do with the strange <laughs> ghostly apparition that shows up and keeps forcing her and tom together in right. the weirdest ways imaginable yeah and and did, did you think that the crab was her mother? That didn't occur to me while I was watching the movie, but now that you say it, it actually does kind of make some sense. There's also a pretty hilarious evidence of a radical rewrite later in the movie, which is that she's talking about how she can't find her mother's earrings, and she believes that her magical cooking power actually came from wearing her mother's earrings. I thought she was talking about the fact that she does have them on, and she's just looking for an explanation. No, she doesn't have them. She wants to go back and get them so that she'll be able to cook. So, uh. like, in her mind, the, like, 
magical crab is just a coincidence <laughs> to her sudden ability to cook. And it's the earrings. The earrings are what have conveyed the magical ability to cook to her. I thought it was a little disingenuous of her when Tom is claiming that she's a witch and she's using magic and she's like, I don't know what's going on. And it was like, well, maybe you should mention the magical crab. <laughs> just, just Or the magical earrings, if that's what you thought it was. It's a little bit crazy the way people respond to there suddenly being magic in the world in this movie. Like, suddenly things are magical. And, you know, sometimes when you're watching a movie, you just sort of accept that certain things are, like, metaphorical. And so mm -hmm. the characters are going to treat them as normal. Because those are visual conceits that the movie is making in order to communicate to us, the viewers. Whereas here, like, the stuff that we see on screen, the characters acknowledge it and talk about it. And so we know that it is literal truth in their world. And yeah. they're not totally freaked the fuck out by the fact that she's making pudding and it vents off enough carbon dioxide smoke <laughs> to kill a horse. Like, that's just okay. <laughs> because it's, it's like, roofied. And so they're like... Ah, oh, that's fucking awesome. Which, it kind of reminded me of David Cronenberg in that way. At Naked Lunch, especially. Like, when shit gets weird, people are kind of creeped out by it, but then there's this sensuality to it, so they're drawn in. And and I, I it, it, it's kind of like that, except cutesier, I guess. This is kind of like Terry Gilliam. Uh, like, especially, I think, of The Fisher King, because that's the only movie he's made that I liked. But, you know, in The Fisher King, where Grand Central turns into this giant ballroom dance because the character is feeling happy and in in this mood and 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 so suddenly the background reflects his mood but then everybody goes back to walking and nobody acknowledges it because it didn't really happen it was right. just a visual conceit here if that scene would have happened everybody would have stopped and been like what the fuck is going on <laughs> no they wouldn't though that's the thing nobody goes what the fuck is going on everybody goes hey nice dancing <laughs> Okay, fair enough, but everybody would have acknowledged it. Rather right, than they noticed that it. it happens, but it's just normal to them. <laughs> everybody needs a good cry now and then. It's therapeutic. That's... <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> the... It's not at all odd that everyone in the restaurant is literally bawling. I seriously did not understand, though, the theology of this movie. I, I really thought that they would come back, that that would be the kind of third act it's it's very formulaic in its kind of basic setup right it's boy meets girl they each have individual problems of their own they find out they complement each other well they have a breakup and uh third act is a an event pulls them back together and they say that they're in love the end right i mean it's it's very formulaic and it's in its setup it's just everything that's hung on that clothesline is fucking batshit but <laughs> i i honestly thought the thing that would pull them back together in the third act would be either tom or her finding out the origins of the crab and finding out the origins of the guy in the pork pie hat and we, the ghost slash angel slash demon <laughs> for all we know right. i mean hell uh and 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 something being explained there but instead that's just all written off and i mean i had a couple of questions i mean there is a lot of magic put into play to get what happens to happen and it felt to me like was this all to save tom from valderon his other chef leaving you know is is tom like is he the messiah or something like if, if valderon left and he didn't have a replacement then he's going to kill himself and and the the world will be plunged into darkness or was this literally heaven-moving events in such a way that Sarah Michelle Gellar was slightly happier? <laughs> and my other question is, what happens when this crab dies? I don't know how long this movie takes. Is it about a week or so? I think it was conveyed badly, but I think it's much longer than that because we have the thing where he doesn't call her and... It feels as if she's just being overwrought and overdramatic and it's like a day later, but I think that's actually meant to be like a month or so later. Oh. Because it's like, we see after that how Tom gets this weird selective amnesia after every date and is like, oh shit, I hate that bitch. 
<laughs> that was the one thing that I felt uncomfortable with in this uh, movie was their love story because he's only in love with her when he's drugged. <laughs> the moral of the movie seems to be don't base your relationship on just drugging a guy. It's not going to work out because... Every time he gets sober, he's going to be like, oh, shit, what am I doing? Right. Yeah, it was uh, every time they ate the food. Uh, that was kind of what I was feeling. It was like, they're actually acting like they're stoned. Yeah. Even in the first time that the food has the magic when it um, causes Amanda Pete to break up with him, she's really acting like she's stoned. I, I think there may have been PCP in her chicken. <laughs> <laughs> she had truth serum chicken poyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which, like, that's one of my favorite scenes ever committed to film, is Amanda <laughs> Pete fucking flipping out, and he's like, but you're not perfect, and she checks out her tits and says, yes, I am. <laughs> she just had to double check to make sure they hadn't changed since she got dressed <laughs> right. that morning. I just, I love that that's how she makes sure. She's like, nope, tits are still great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. But she's she's committed to truth there. Like, she has to verify. She's not just going to assume... <laughs> That her tits right, she, are still amazing. She, she was a Reagan era kid. Trust but verify. <laughs> I could watch that scene on repeat all day, man. <laughs> Just her fucking throwing plates around and shit. Oh, man. We keep talking about how batshit crazy this movie is. It may sound like we didn't like it, but <laughs> it's really actually a very fun and enjoyable movie if you just don't try to understand it. <laughs> Right, do not try to understand the philosophical or theological implications of it. It's kind of, uh, I, it's it's like Last Temptation of Christ, basically, you know? It's like, as long as you just accept that it's fable, then it's awesome. It's fucking great, right? If, if, if you expect to be converted to Catholicism, then you might come out a little lacking. <laughs> Speaking of Amanda Peet's character, I want to talk about the fact that Amanda Pete, Lois, which, what was it, Patricia Clark Clarkson, is that right? Yeah. And Sarah Michelle Gellar all play, in different ways, very sexually forward characters. That's And it's not, like, a bad thing. Like, Amanda Pete isn't a scary, sexually aggressive monster in this movie because she's kind of the, the ex, right? She's not portrayed in that way. She's portrayed as kind of overbearing, but not related to sex. The fact that our our women have healthy sex drives, because I was like, you know, like, Lois is essentially a grown-up version of the vengeful sluts from My Best Friend's Wedding in a lot of ways, right? And she is presented as awesome, and, and she is... And like I was, I was gonna say the the her relationship with Jonathan, who she's obsessed with from the beginning, and then she gets him high, and they make out in an elevator. But after that point, you see that there's real affection there, and that even when they're both sober, he's still interested in her. There's actually a moment that really made me laugh between them, a little exchange between them. I know what it is <laughs> <laughs> when she says, or he says, "Meet me in whatever," and she says. You're the boss. He goes, would, would, would you you be the boss this time? Yes. I, the I, line is delivered so perfectly. It's hilarious. Dylan Baker is, is brilliant. I mean, ever since I saw him in Happiness, I am just, anytime he shows up in a movie, I get a big grin on my face. His reading of that line was so vulnerable and brilliant. It was just such a great moment. And it was, and the flirty look that she gives after that. And the fact that, like, Sarah Michelle Gellar, they, they have this whole conversation, and it's it's a weird non sequitur, which really everything in this movie is. <laughs> but she has this conversation with her her Rupert Everett in this movie, you know, her super supportive male friend who isn't actually interested in her in that way. But they're talking about how often men think about sex in the day, and she's trying on, out, or, well, not trying on, but showing him outfits and deciding what to wear and he gives this tell that supposedly tells that men are thinking about sex with one outfit, and she gives this look, and she goes, really? And if she's not like, ew, stop. She's just like, wow, nice. You know, like, right. I, 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 that moment really endeared me to the character. Both characters, and I laughed. I laughed at that. The character you're talking about is named Nolan, and it's played by Larry Gilliard. Okay. Just so you know. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and he has some great lines, too. Like, he says, and this was another uh, tell, I think, for how long that it was supposed to be 
before the guy had called him back. He said, if you don't shut up and call him, I'm going to cut off my ears and send them to him. <laughs> so, yeah, I really think that this movie was made by precocious 7 to 12 year olds who don't really understand how to put a movie together, but were really, really, really interested in trying. Right. Then, apparently, the script was punched up by kind of, like, their dirty aunt or something. <laughs> Put in some, like, oh, there should be a sex joke here. Yeah, everybody will love that. And and, and then the, the one female character that I felt fell really short was Aunt Stella. But that's really just because she just drops off the face of the planet, like, 20 minutes in. Yeah, it's like, did she die halfway through the filming, and so they had to write her out, but they'd already filmed the final scene? I don't I don't know what the <laughs> hell was going on there. I, uh, I think a lot of people died during the making of this movie. <laughs> Maybe that's why it had such a limited release and none of us have ever heard of it. Perhaps. It, I've noticed that we're, we're not really talking about the relationship or the relation between Sarah Michelle Gellar and Sean Patrick Flannery. I think because it is totally a non sequitur to this movie. It's like, well, we got to have a romantic interest in it. Our conflict has to revolve around that. But then when it actually comes to making the movie, it's not even relevant. He's He's totally a MacGuffin right he could be anyone and there's no reason that she likes him yeah he's, he's just hot they don't have any special connection there doesn't really in my opinion even seem to be chemistry between them the first time we see them when she's chasing the magical crab around at the street market <laughs> and she grabs his leg thinking it might be a crab <laughs> for yes. some reason he looks down at her and he's supposed to be like smiling affectionately or something it's supposed to be that like magical love at first sight moment and to me it looked like he was laughing derisively like look at this crazy <laughs> bitch so i didn't even buy the relationship between them and it seemed like it was just a total waste they could have totally taken out the love between the two of them and just had their relationship be about the fact that she's a cook and he suddenly needs a cook and it would have been just fine and maybe even better i mean for all we know this was just a circuitous route to get lois and jonathan together i think it's probably more likely that it was to free those poor chefs from the truffle cult <laughs> perhaps <laughs> i want to point out my favorite dirty line from the movie <laughs> which is sarah michelle geller giving the most fuck me eyes i've seen in a long while and saying one good sexual thought takes at least 20 minutes. Yeah, she gives a lot of good fuck me eyes in this movie too, actually. Like, remember when she's standing in the middle of the open construction site? <laughs> that was when I went, wait, 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 what? Are, are they going to bone in the middle of this active construction site? They're building a restaurant and she's standing in the middle. There are workers walking around and carrying ladders and crap. Actually, that reminds me of something that I noticed a lot of times throughout this movie. The mirrors. There are mirrors on the wall in the restaurant, and so we're seeing the fronts and backs of our characters. And then there are mirrors on three of the four walls in the elevator that we spend probably a total of half an hour in in this movie. <laughs> There's one fairly important scene where sarah michelle geller and sean patrick flannery are in the elevator and there are three of her and five of him in that shot because of the multiple mirrors and the <laughs> infinity mirror setup and then when we're in the ballroom dance scene there are mirrors everywhere and there are mirrors all over the department store and there are just a lot of shots with mirrors in them and normally filmmakers avoid mirrors because it's right. hard to hide your crew and your equipment and that kind of stuff but I almost wonder if it's because this movie was made for the benefit of a seven-year-old with leukemia who wanted to be a costume designer, that they wanted to show those costumes from every possible angle <laughs> in every shot. The only time that I really noticed them was the ballroom dance scenes, and I thought what they were going for with, I, I think it's the last shot of the movie, uh, or, or no, it's the last scene in the movie where Sarah Michelle Gellar is standing in the middle of the ballroom dance floor and sean patrick flannery approaches her and you see her in every mirror and then he appears in one mirror two mirror three mirrors and on and on and and my only assumption there was that it was like this is him committing all the way to this relationship bit by bit by bit as he walks across the floor i thought it was 
emblematic of that. But yes, perhaps that's what it is. That Because Sarah Michelle Gellar's costume designer who got an opening credit was probably also another <laughs> Leukemia Make-A-Wish patient. And, and they were like, we're going to show off the shit out of every costume that anybody in this movie wears. Unless the mirrors are some sort of a metaphor that was lost on us. Maybe it's emblematic of how the, the dead people in their lives are always watching them. Mm, but the, I think the crab serves that purpose <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> which i you know and then there's i mean there's so much in this movie like paper airplane fetishism that poor guy who gets all of his stuff knocked down and you really feel like he was meant to be a recurring character and then it's just that one joke right the line i just mugged a 75 year old for that dessert and you took it from me. <laughs> i mean it's this movie is just nonstop. like, what? The most sense we've made out of it is to ascribe this to a dying child. That can't, <laughs> that can't be right, right? I mean, <laughs> yet, yet it's like, yes, that makes sense. This totally fits. <laughs> I actually wrote, this is kind of like a Tom Stoppard play because it's just all non sequiturs, you know? It's just all, oh, now this will happen. And, and in a Tom Stoppard play, it's generally like, now this will happen to show off how clever of a cat's cradle I can weave with words, and then we just cut to something else because that really wasn't going anywhere, right? <laughs> but with this, it's like, oh, now I'm going to do this non sequitur, and we'll put in puffins, whatever, you know? And, and, <laughs> and then the next scene will just be there because, like, for instance, the whole magical crab setup is set up as if it's going to mean something, and then just through the movie, they just cut to the crab now and then, and it really doesn't possibly mean... It could just the be... The crab and all his different costumes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like the salad. He, he becomes a crab salad at one point. <laughs> and the top hat at the end, because he was fucked by the French guy, I guess? I don't, I don't know. Or she, if it was her mom. <laughs> I mean, you could kind of see, like, maybe her mom was like, yay, I get to... I get to be with a French chef. I mean, maybe that was kind of her dream, you know? I, this, I, it's so fucking batshit, and I love it. I love <laughs> every frame of this movie. And I want to date Amanda Peach from this movie. <laughs> like, desperately. Okay, so, if you could change one thing in this movie to make it better, what would it be? Okay, so you mentioned that there was a distinct lack of any reveal, right? They yeah. never tell us what the fuck has been going on, which is sort of, that's the contract between the filmmaker and the watcher, right? They're going to at least give you some sort of clue as to what was really going on, and they never really do that. They give us a lot of possible outs, you know, the earrings, the crab, the blah, 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 and they do even give us the possible out of when uh, uh, Nolan says to her, you just really wanted to make something good at that point. So it's like, as if her, she was a bad chef for like 10 years, and then just one night she just really committed herself to it, and after that she was a good chef. There could be no magic to the cooking at all in this movie so what i would probably do is add a scene to the end of this movie where we do get an explanation and that explanation is that nolan has been putting drugs in the food while sarah michelle or shell geller was cooking it so like while she was making the desserts he was putting in ecstasy or something like that so that explains everybody's reaction to the food and he goes to jail <laughs> as the only black man in the movie <laughs> he has to go to jail. right yeah i i agree that the film needs some sort of explanation if i were to change one thing it would be that you know either she finds out that the crab is her mom and the crab finally talks to her and they have some sort of heart-to-heart -to -heart towards the end of the movie, and the crab is like, look, honey, I just wanted you to be happy. You know, if this isn't making you happy, then don't do it, or whatever. And then that's how she kind of comes to her realization to be back with Sean Patrick Flannery. Or it would be that we find out that that angel creature is actually a demon, 
and the crab is some sort of mind control evil thing, and <laughs> she has to slay it with, uh, I don't know, a, a, a magical stick of butter or some shit, you know, <laughs> uh, something like that. Yeah, I think I think that's probably, you know, it's easy to just say, and then a demon appears, right? I mean, that's how every movie should end. <laughs> so um, I encourage everybody actually to hunt down a copy of this movie because it is well worth the watch. Get together with a group of friends throw it on and enjoy the shit out of yourselves possibly engage in extracurricular <laughs> yeah do not uh, watch this uh, movie sober <laughs> recreational <laughs> drugs if that's legal in your state which will be here soon huzzah and then once you're done please rate and review us on itunes or on soundcloud or whatever let us know what you think, info at iceonmars.net, and you can, of course, go to iceonmars.net for more information. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley. And J. Wilford Neville. Everyone, have a good one. Meow. You have been listening to Ice on Mars. <laughs> <laughs>